Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Man, I, I love Sundays um, because it's my favorite day of the week. Uh, because I get to see all my friends, you know. Um, but man, I'm, I am excited for today. Um, yesterday we had a great time at our lake day, which was incredible. Uh, we had so, so much fun. It's probably, in my opinion, since I got here, the best lake day we've ever had. Um, we had boats. Kids were going tubing on boats, and we had uh, paddle boards, and we had uh, uh, cornhole, and we had food, and we had each other, and it was it was hot, but we had sunscreen. Some of us used a little less sunscreen than others, uh, including myself, if you didn't notice. Uh, but I can tell, you know, we had a, a great, uh, great uh, uh, day yesterday, staying cool in the water. It was amazing. I don't think Teresa is with us, but thank you, Teresa, for, if you're watching. Thank you for opening up your, your space for us to come and join you. Let's give it up for Teresa. She's amazing. We had a really good time of fellowship and lots of sun and lots of water. And it's always great. And I love um, being able to connect outside of a Sunday morning because we have a limited time here on Sunday. But when we can gather together outside, uh, we can grow closer to one another. We can share each other's burdens. We can celebrate together. We can mourn together. And so I had an incredible time. I want to encourage you next year. We're going to be doing it again. So I encourage you to uh, make plans to come uh, with us next year. Uh, we're going to continue in our series today. We started a couple Sundays ago. Uh, we started a series called uh, Questions God Asks Us. And we're going through some of the questions uh, uh, throughout Scripture that God asked of His people or asked His people uh, throughout the Bible. And there's so many questions that God asked in Scripture. And I believe a lot of these questions God is not, didn't just ask thousands of years ago. He didn't just ask to them. But I think God is asking the same question here for us today. And the question we're going to go through today is this question, which is, what do you have in your hand? It's this question that comes out in the book of Exodus, but have you ever had something, been looking for something, and then you realize you have it in your hand the whole time? Maybe it's your keys. Now, unfortunately, this morning, I wish I had my keys in my hand because what happened was is I went into my office early this morning and I put my keys on my desk and then I went out to the foyer and I tried to get back in to realize I couldn't get back into my office. It's like, I think it was 6.15 this morning. I'm like, uh-oh. So I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I don't have a spare key because we have to get our locks changed. And so I'm like, I don't think I have a spare key. So I'm like, hey, Beth, do you think you could come uh, open the church, uh, my office for me? At about, and she got to the church at 7.15 this morning. Let's give it up for Beth for saving me today. Yeah, I knew exactly where they were, right on my desk, where I had placed them so perfectly this morning. You know, what do you have in your hand is a question that God asks us or asked in Scripture. And before we get into that question, I want to start the story or preface the story um, with this. And it's the next question that God asks us, and it comes in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. And it's this. It says, it says but Moses protested again. He said, what if they won't believe me? What if they won't listen to me? And what if they say the Lord never appeared to you? He's saying, I don't want to do it. I can't do it. What if this happens? What if they don't believe? What if they don't trust me? What if what I say, they're like, ah, you didn't actually see God. He didn't actually show up to you. This, 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 this mind of excuses running through his mind. And the story, if you know it, comes right after God encounter, uh, Moses encounters God and, and God's telling him his plan for letting the people go in Exodus chapter 3. When God encounters Moses, and, and if you know the story well, Moses is filled with excuses as to why what's about to take place is not possible. What were his excuses? God has laid out this extravagant plan to lead his people out of Egypt and lead them into a place that's filled with milk and honey. A great dream, but it's going to come at a great cost. It's not going to come for free. It's going to take effort and it's going to take work. And Moses is protesting. 
Not even the first time he's protested, and it's not the last time he protests throughout the story. And you know what the story reminds me of? It reminds me of myself and all the excuses I have in my life when it comes to doing the things that I know God has called me to do. The things that scripture has laid out for me to how I'm supposed to live my life and how many times my excuses get in the way. What are the excuses we have in our life? Moses says, I'm not very good at speaking. What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? See, Moses had many excuses, but a lack of confidence. He had a lack of confidence in who he was. And do you know why? Because Moses had lived kind of a troubled life. You know, you know Moses, he's found, and then he, he goes into the palace, and then he sees one of his own people getting bullied by, by, by the Egyptians. So he goes and he kills the Egyptian, and then he runs away for 40 years, lives in the desert as a shepherd, tries to get away and then he comes back and he's encountered by God in this burning bush and God says, go. He's like, do you know my past? Do you know my story? And God's like, "Uh, yes, I know your story. I know what's going on in your life, but I'm calling you to do something amazing and miraculous. And Moses, rather than be excited for the call, says, send somebody else. Right, I'm not good enough. Maybe other excuses that we have in our own life. There's, there's so many that tend to come up. It might be our lack of education. Or it might be our lack of resource. It might be apathy. We just don't really care. It might be fear. We're scared. It maybe is us questioning whether God was actually the one speaking to us. Or maybe we're saying, I'm too old. It's too late for me. Send somebody else. Or maybe we're saying, I'm too young. I don't have the experience yet. I don't have the the knowledge yet. I don't have the ideas yet. And God goes on this journey with Moses trying to convince him that he is capable. He says, you got it. Go do it. I've called you to do it. And not only does he call him to do it, he says, I'm going to give you everything you need to do it. He says, yes, this is a big call. Yes, this is a big mission. Yes, this is a big thing to do. But guess what? I'm going to give you everything you need. Take a look. It always, Moses has the excuses. Always doesn't want to go. But what are our excuses? Maybe there's some excuses in your life when it comes to living out the call or living out what scripture, how scripture teaches us to live. And maybe we're going through some things and we're trying to figure it out. If we're, we're trying to figure out this journey of faith. We're trying to figure out what it means to have a relationship, a deep connection with Jesus. We're trying to understand and figure it out in our own minds, but we all have these excuses that tend to get in the way. But I think before we get into the question, I think another question is, are you confident with what God has already shown you? Are you confident in the things that you haven't seen yet? And this is how the Bible describes faith. You probably know this verse. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's what faith is. See, rather than having excuses, we need to be confident, even if we haven't seen the end yet. Why are we confident? We're not confident because we think we're capable. We're confident because we know he's capable. We're confident in what the future is going to look like. Why? Not because of our own ideas, but because of what God has given us and what God is speaking to us and what we're hearing him say. That's where our confidence comes from. We're confident in what we hope for. I know a lot of us today, whether you're watching online or you're here in the room, a lot of us, we have a lot of things we're hopeful for. We have a lot of things that we're, that, that we're desiring. We have a lot of things that, that God has spoken to us and we're waiting in this waiting period for it. And I know it's scary. I know it can be frustrating. I know it can even make us angry when we're waiting. We're like, God, like, like why aren't you showing up? Why aren't you doing what you said you would do? Why am I still struggling? Why is this still happening in my life? It's been going on and on and on. But why we're confident, why is it because we trust that when God calls us, he also prepares us? That everything that we go through prepares us for something in the future. See, when Moses went and he killed that Egyptian, where did he go? He went to the, the desert. He left for 40 years. And then guess who's the person who led Israel through, through, the, through, through the desert for 40 more years? The guy who had already done it. 
the guy who was prepared to do it. Yes, I'm sure those 40 years felt horrible and tough, but it prepared him for the future that was gonna take place. No one else was capable of leading them through that moment and through that season than Moses. And if we continue in the story of Moses, we see this question that God asks Moses after he's filled with all these excuses. In next, uh, chapter, uh, verse two says this, then the Lord asked him, what is in your hand? And he says, a shepherd's staff. God asks this simple yet profound question. What is in your hand? It's simple because it's a question we can all answer. And it's profound because it's this question. God is also answering the question we may ask him, which is, what do I need? Where am I going? What do you need? Well, the answer to that question is, what do you already have? See, when we ask the question, we say, God, this is what I need. He says, I already have given it to you. What's in your hand? And Moses says, I got my staff. And I have a, a, a cane here. If you want to grab it from me. It's my mom, by the way. She's the best. She came for Jane's birthday. This, this, is, this cane right here is a special cane to me. Why? Because this was my grandfather's cane. And my grandfather was in the military, and for a lot of his service, he served in Europe. And each one of these different uh, pendants uh, represents a different country or different campground that he stayed at while he was going away. So I have this cane. He passed away in uh, 2021. Now, this cane is special to me because I have so many memories of my grandfather with this cane walking around. He, he, he was a paratrooper in the military. Do you know what that means? He had bad ankles and bad knees. Okay? He had many surgeries, many times where he had fallen, out, gone out of planes and jumped out of airplanes. Like a true definition of what we would say, a hero. I remember one time we, Beth and I, we were planning on going on vacation and, and he let us use his air miles. And I said, hey, Grandpa, are you sure? Like, you don't want to travel anymore? And he said to me, I, I promise, he said this. He said, I've been up in an airplane 286 times and never landed once. I don't plan to go on another airplane. That's what he said to me. I was like, yeah, that's a different perspective than I've ever had. Every time I've gone up in an airplane, I've landed every single time. But he had this cane that he used and he, he would walk. And I don't remember if it was this exact, this exact cane that he had. But this cane or this staff that he had, uh, for Beth and I's wedding, uh, my grandmother passed away of cancer. And like a couple months before she passed away, my grandfather, they were in Zellers, if you remember Zellers. And uh, my grandma saw these wedding rings that she loved. And so she showed them to my grandpa and he snuck back there and bought them for her. And then a couple months later, she barely even got to wear them and she passed away. And then a couple of years later, a few years later, when, I, when I, my, he found out I was going to propose to Beth, what happened was, is, is he's like, hey, Dustin, can I talk with you in my bedroom? And she never did that. Like, it was kind of weird. I was like, all right, man, like, what's going on, right? And he says, hey, I want to give you these wedding rings. I want you to give them to Beth for her, for, for her to wear. And I, now... No one else knows what's going on. I'm in my grandpa's room. I think we're watching the Super Bowl, and I come out of the room trying not to cry, right? Like, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm like bawling, and everyone, and everyone just stares at me. I just walk outside and put them in my car, and at my wedding, my grandpa was the ring bearer at my wedding, carrying my grandma's wings down the aisle to my wife. Incredible. And I don't remember exactly if this is the cane he used, but he walked down the aisle with, with a cane down the aisle to present me with these rings. Now I'm going to try not to cry uh, here today. Um, but, 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 but this cane had, had importance to us and to our family. Now I have it uh, in my office. Now I don't use it to walk because I don't need it yet. Maybe one day I will, but that's a cane that has this significance and, and, it, and to me, but to some people, what is it? It's just a little cane. It's just insignificant. It's just this little staff. And I think Moses, the same thing happened. He says, hey, what do you, God's like, what do you have? And I think maybe even sarcastically, he's like, well, I got this shepherd's staff. That's what I got. I don't got maybe the talent. I don't have the ability to speak, but what do I have? I got this little cane. What are you going to do about it, right? Kind of like that. That's kind of how I picture it. Maybe he was more confident than that. But he looks down and what does he see? He sees his staff. The one he used for walking. The one he used for protecting his flock. A simple staff for getting around. 
Nothing really special. It wasn't like you had magical powers or it, it didn't have an abundant blessing. But it was simple and humble. It's this shepherd's staff. I think God might be asking us the same question today. What is in your hand? What do you have? See, the question isn't what do I need? The question that God asks is, is what do you have? The question that, that, that is so simple and yet so profound, what do you have? What is in your hand? So Moses says, I got my shepherd's staff. That's it. That's what I got. And then he says, what do you want me to do with it? God says, throw it down on the ground. The one thing I have, throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw the staff down and it turned into a snake. The favorite part of the story, Moses jumped back. How many of y'all know if a snake was in the room, we'd be jumping back? There's one thing, there's a few things I, I don't like. There's a few things I'm scared of. And there's very minuscule things that, that almost freeze me with fear. And one of those things is snakes. Now, I've never had a bad encounter with a snake in my life, but I've never had a good encounter with a snake in my life either, okay? My, my encounters with snakes is limited, okay? What a wild part of this story, though. What do you want me to do with the staff? The one thing I have. What do you want me to do with it? Throw it on the ground. And when Moses done this, it does this, it turns into a snake. Yesterday, uh, Friday was Jane's birthday. She turned four years old this past Friday, which was amazing. And we went to West Edmonton Mall. And while we were walking, we were right outside where the sea lions are. And they were doing a display where they had a snake that people were paying money to go touch and hold. And I was, I was walking as quick as I could past the table. I'm like, what if? Right? It's a snake comes on the ground. So when his staff turns into a snake, what does he do? He jumps back. And I think likely for two reasons. Shock and fear. Because that's exactly what I would have done, right? What happens? Shock and fear. Why? Because he jumps back and he realizes, how did my staff just become a snake on the ground? And how do I escape from this snake? This miracle that takes place in front of him with his humble staff. And then in verse 4 it says this, Then the Lord told him, Reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. See, Moses wasn't likely new to encounters with snakes. He probably dealt with them before while he was in the desert. He'd probably had to protect his flock from snakes. It probably wasn't his first encounter from snakes. So he would know that the way you want to pick up a snake is not by its tail. It's actually not the best plan at all. In fact, I would say it's a horrible plan. If you're going to pick up a snake, which I don't suggest, don't pick it up by its tail. But God looks at Moses and says, hey, pick it up by its tail. What a request. If you're going to pick up a snake, you want to pick it up closer to its teeth. Number one is you don't know what could be in the tail, depending on the type of snake. And you also don't want to pick it up by its snake because then it can still bite you. So Moses, what does he do? He does exactly what God calls him to do. I mean, there's a lot been going on in Moses' life. I think he's like, I'm just going to do it, right? If this is the end, this is the end. I don't even have to go, right? So he picks up the snake by the tail. And why does God say pick it up by the tail? Because again, it's not a good idea. I think the main reason why God says pick it up by its tail is it's an act of obedience. Saying, do you trust me? Do you trust me that I'll protect you? Will you obey when I ask you to do something that might not make sense? A lot of Moses' story, if you read it, doesn't make a lot of sense. But Moses was obedient through it all. Will you obey even when the call is difficult? And in verse five, it says this, perform this sign of throwing the stick, or the, the staff and becoming a snake. Perform this sign. And the Lord told them, and they will b believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. Now, if there's one thing that we need to know and one thing we cannot forget about our God is that he takes what's in our hands and does the miraculous. He takes what we have and does the miraculous. 
what we have might be small and humble. It might seem insignificant. It might not even have power in somebody else's hands, but what God has placed in our hands becomes powerful when we let him use it. In God's hands, our little becomes mighty. A little staff becomes a snake. A simple dream becomes revival. A simple seed becomes a church. A simple idea becomes a business. A simple conversation becomes a marriage. A simple phone call becomes forgiveness. See, simple prayer can become a miracle. A small step can become a marathon. And a small amount of faith can become a tree. I think sometimes we're waiting to go to God when we have it all together. When we look in our bank account, we're like, I feel comfortable now doing what God has called me to do. We're waiting for us to feel ready or to feel prepared. And God's saying, what you already have is enough. We're saying, God, send me. We're saying, God, I want to do something amazing. And he's like, what about your family? I've already placed your family in your hands. I've already placed your kids in your hands. Our little in his hands becomes mighty. What do you have in your hand? What has God given you? What do you already have? How can you invest it or how can you make it grow? See, I think sometimes we're scared to use what we have. We're afraid to use it. We're afraid to use it, but I want to encourage you. You have a voice and you have influence. You have the position or you have the title. You have the plan. You have the idea. You have the dream. You have the willpower, but we don't want to use it because we're afraid. And it reminds me of this parable uh, that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25. It's a story of the talents. Maybe you know this story. With the master, he gives three servants different amounts of money from bigger and kind of they go smaller. And upon his return, he leaves and upon his return, he sees that two have invested the money that they were given. They invested their talents and they made them grow. But one has not. And we can read it together in Matthew chapter 25, verse 24. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man harvesting crops. You didn't plant and gathering crops. You didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gathered crops, I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. At least. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver, the one with the most. He says this, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus gives each and every one of us, God gives us each and every one of us, varying abilities and talents and ideas and dreams and positions and He puts something in our hand. And I think sometimes there's this problem where maybe we have a lot and we can become arrogant or prideful. Or maybe there's some of us who have little and we just think, I'm not going to use this because little old me. Why do I only have this when they have all that? But when he puts something in our hand, he wants us to use it. He doesn't give us something just for us to hold, hoard it or for us to show off or to to have it to, to impress other people. He gives it to us to use it to invest and grow the kingdom. See, what you have in your hand, it is enough. And I think if we start to be faithful with what we already have, the story is saying you're gonna get more. You know, if you look through the scripture, there's so many times where little became a lot. If you remember, see the boy who had just a few fish and some bread. 
and he brought it to Jesus' hands and it fed thousands of people with leftovers. We see the widow who has just a little bit of oil and she, brings, she brought it to the prophet and the prophet gave her the idea and then it overflowed. We see the people at the wedding bring Jesus what they had, which was just some water. And he turned it into wine. He takes the little we have in our hands and he makes it abundant. When you look down, you might just see a staff. You might just see one little thing. And rather than be ashamed of what you have, rejoice in what you have because it's already enough. See, God asks Moses to use his staff and guess what Moses does? He does. If you, if you know the story, this is the start of getting an entire nation out of captivity, this humble moment, this humble staff, this small, insignificant thing that he had. See, what if the answer to our prayers was already in our hands? What if the way out of our tough situation, we already had the tools to create? What if the desires of our heart that are unfulfilled were already beginning to take flight? What if, what if what you need, you already have, but you're asking for more? God is asking, what do you have in your hand? And it's not because he doesn't know. It's not like he's looking at us with our hands full, being like, what is that? He knows. He knows what we have in our hands. Not, but it's because he wants you to look. I think sometimes our eyes are on the problem. I think sometimes our eyes are on the circumstance or our eyes are on the fear or our eyes are on everything else. And God's like, do you see what you already have in your hand? That's the way out. If you know this staff plays a significant role throughout the story. The staff that Moses had, it didn't just turn into a snake. It did many things throughout the story because he was willing to use what he had to live out the call that God had placed on his life. It might be time to reflect and think, what do I have? Rather than thinking about what you don't have, how many of y'all know that's easy? I know exactly what I don't have. A, car, a van that can go over 70 kilometers an hour. I know. But what if our eyes shifted to what I do have? What do I have? What do you have in your hand? God has already given us an abundance. And if we are faithful and willing to use what we have, mighty things are going to happen in humble beginnings It might take you creating a gratitude journal to take an inventory of all the blessings in your life. See, the strength that you need to make it through or the courage you need to make it through, you already have. We have to bring the little strength, bring the little courage, and let God have it. And it will exponentially grow. We need to bring the little joy the little peace, the little patience, the little goodness that we have and bring it to his hands and we're going to see it grow. It's interesting that Jesus says the mustard seed, one of the smallest seeds, is the, all the faith we need. See, God's not asking us to, to, to show up as an apple tree. He's saying, give me the seed and watch. If we're willing to water it, we're willing to grow it. We're willing to put in the patience. We're willing to take out the weeds. We're willing to put in the work. We're going to see it grow. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 says this, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You ever try and count to infinity? I have not. 
But there was a, a, a YouTuber who counted to 100,000 and, and they said it took him 40 hours to come to 100,000, infinitely more. He is able to do more than we can ask or think. You ever hear some, you know, motivational speaker? Get your biggest dream and double it, right? God's like, how about you multiply it by infinity and see what happens? Infinitely more than we could ask or think. You have what you need. Why? Because the source is the creator of the universe. That's the source. I think sometimes we look at our bank accounts and we're like, man, this isn't good. Or sometimes we look at the gas in our car and we're in the middle of nowhere like, this is a problem. We have the source with us at all times. The one who never leaves us or forsakes us is with you always. The one who will find you on the mountaintop, the one who will find you in the valley, he's right beside you always. The one who finds you when you dig yourself and put yourself in a pit, the one who, 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 who finds you there. The one who runs away and takes the inheritance and we just go and we live an extravagant life, he's still waiting for us to come back home because he's the source of everything we need. He can do more than we could ever ask or think. And I think sometimes we're asking for so little and God's like, you got to ask for more. He says he'll give us the abundant life. Not a, a life filled with money and things, but a life filled with purpose. I think sometimes we go around life and we're like, God, I feel like I don't have purpose. I feel like, like I'm, what I'm doing is pointless. I, I feel like I'm not making a difference. I feel like I'm not making an impact. I'm like, God, why am I feeling this way? And I think sometimes we've got to sit back and God's asking, what do you have in your hand? What tool do you have? What are you carrying? And then he can take it and make it infinitely more than what you already have. What is in your hand? You know, our takeaway today, just like last week, is just going to blow your mind. It's this, what is in your hand? Wow. <laughs> it's a question I think we need to Spend some time figuring out. No matter what season we are in life, some of us were, were tired and some of us were having kids. Some of us are just starting our career. Some of us are just starting school. Some of us are grandparents. It doesn't matter what season you are in your life. Take time to understand that if, he's, if you're still here, he's not done and it's never too late to use what he's placed in your hand. What do you have in your hand? You now I want to pray for us, for God to maybe reveal what we have. I think sometimes we're sitting here being like, okay, God, what do I have in my hand? You're like, and most of the time it's my cell phone on social media. And God's like, maybe find a different tool, you know? <laughs> Phones are important, right? I, I get it. But what else do you have in your hand? Take some time to understand, what do I have? What talents do I have? What gifts are inside of me that never have come to pass yet? And, you know, I've said this many times, but without my mother, I wouldn't be here. Because you know what she had? Prayer. When I was out, you know, gallivanting in the streets, my mom was praying for me. I think sometimes we think, God, but I want to do something. I want to give. I want to do this. He's like, can you just sit down and pray? Can you just sit down and, and, and lift up your kids to me? Can you just sit down and listen? What we have, we already need. And I think sometimes we're looking for, for all the resource and everything. And oftentimes, it starts with a simple prayer. You know what the prayer is? Here I am, send me. What is in your hand? Your life. Your position. Your title is in your hand. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with your title as a father? What are you doing with your title as a mother? What are you doing with your title as a grandparent? What are you doing with what God has already given you? Are we being faithful? 
What is in your hand? We need to think and begin to understand what God has placed inside of us already and know that he is our source. So whatever he's asking us to do, we already have what we need, but we gotta open our eyes. I wanna pray for us this morning. First of all, God, we thank you that we, that you are enough. As we were saying about earlier, Jaira, more than enough. Our provider. Everything we need, you, you, we already have everything we need. You are our source. So God, today we fix our eyes on you. And we ask this question of what is in our hand. God, I pray that you reveal it to us. God, I pray that you open up doors that need to be open for us to actually see what we have. And God, I pray that we are faithful. More than anything, God, I pray that we are faithful with, my, with what might seem insignificant, with, my, with what might seem small, with what might seem pointless. God, I pray that we're faithful with what we have. We don't just hide it and bury it, but we let our light shine before others. And that you use what you've placed in our hand to do amazing things. In Jesus' name, amen.